um, predicting migration and the implications on Europe. Um, we first have two speakers that work directly with policymakers. We first have Rainer Munz, who's been working with the EU Commission for a long time, uh, advising decision makers at the EU level. Um, he's a migration expert with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Um, his talk will focus on the future of migration to and within Europe. Uh, next up, we have Holger Zahl, who is um, an analyst with Frontex, dealing with um, forecasting, early warning, um, and scenario building in his day-to-day -day work and advising EU member states um, on uh, uh, future trends. So we're interested to hear from him on the latest trends and future developments in, in Europe. Uh, third, we have Tobias Heidland, who's a senior reader at the Kiel Institute for the World Economy and also an incoming professor at Kiel University, professor of economics. Tobias is involved in a range of research projects um, relating to forecasting, both using digital trace data, but also more traditional um, uh, uh, forecasting methods, and has recently also been involved in a forecasting project to project flows to, to Germany. So we're interested to hear from Tobias. Uh, and lastly, we have Peter Bendel. Peter, Peter is a chair of the expert council of German foundations on integration and migration, um, a well-known and influential um, think tank uh, and, and policy advisory board uh, here in Germany. And they have last year released a large report on um, also migration from Africa. and um, Petra will complement the panel really well because she will um, describe a cautionary tale about what uh, implications faulty uh, forecasts and predictions may have. So um, I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion and thanks to all of you. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. If you do have a comment, please post it in the chat box. Please always make your affiliation known and address the speaker directly if you have a question specific to one of the presentations. Um, to everyone else, yeah, please mute yourself when you're not talking, um, and then I will uh, call on individual speakers to, to make their presentation. So, um, with great pleasure, I'm handing off to the first speaker, Rainer Münz, for this presentation. Please be reminded to keep your presentations to 10 to 12 minutes so we can have uh, ample discussions after your uh, uh, intervention and also after all the interventions have finished towards the end to allow for questions from the audience. So with that, I'm handing over to you, Rainer, and um, thank you very much. Good morning to my co-panelists, to you, Jasper, and to people listening uh, video. Unfortunately, we cannot meet in person in Vienna, but uh, we do the best uh, under these conditions. And so I'm going to share my presentation with you. Um, so I'm, I'm just presenting a few scenarios, but uh, in order to understand the scenarios, I think it's good to understand what is going on, what is the status quo. <clears throat> and so these are the most important gates of entry and flows into the uh, EU and into other countries uh, of the OECD world as well. So we have in most prominently asylum. This um, peaked, as we all know, in 2015-16. It was uh, then came down back again, and uh, um, we have uh, we have already seen um, uh, these uh, these figures here um, when when comparing them with uh, with the Google Trends. Uh, um, thing that we were looking at, uh, just a second. Um, then we have um, labor migration. So labor migration was between 500 and 600,000 first uh, permits issued in the early 2000s. This went dramatically down as a consequence of the financial crisis and the high numbers of uh, unemployed uh, people in, 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 in EU countries. Uh, stayed at the low level, recovered a little bit um, over the last uh, couple of years. Then we have the most important and most stable gate of entry, which is marriage, migration, and family reunion. So the EU is admitting, has admitted in 2018 almost 800,000 people more under, than under any other category. Um, for labor migration, uh, for for marriage and uh, family reunion reasons, 
and then we have educational migration. Now, what do we know when we speak about near casting, about the immediate future? Um, we know that uh, this number was higher in 2019, about 650,000, so went back up again, and will be lower this year because of travel restrictions and other reasons. We see that uh, the number of asylum uh, requests so far until uh, the end of September is about 36% lower in EU countries than it was um, a year ago. <clears throat> we can also assume that this number of uh, work-related permits will go down this year, just for the same reason as we had it 12 years ago during the financial crisis, because unemployment is going up and the demand for additional labor is going down in Europe. I'm also showing these uh, gates of entry because they have heavy implications for the integration of migrants. We know that people coming as labor migrants quickly find jobs, already have job offers, um, have the skills mix required um, to, to be economically active and successful. But we know that people coming as dependent family members, um, as newlywed spouses, and at people um, coming um, um, as refugees take on average about 15 to 20 years till a cohort coming that way uh, achieves the same labor market degree of labor market integration um, as natives do. So the gate of entry has implications for uh, the future of migration. So when we look into the future, I think it's important um, in the context of what we are doing today to distinguish between forecasts and projections on the one side and foresight on the other hand. And I'm just showing this as the most trivial example. When you look at the Eurostat, Europop projections, you see there's a baseline scenario with immigration and emigration taking place, and there is a no migration scenario. So there's not much foresight behind this, but these are the two scenarios that are um, offered here. Uh, it's more an analytical scenario that would say what's the contribution of migration, but at least the baseline scenario assumes uh, that the trends as we see them uh, would continue until uh, the mid of the 21st century. So there's two scenarios so that the projection is the forecasting element and the, the foresight is behind the scenarios. It's important to distinguish when we look at demographic projections. Same when we look at future age distribution, we see that the difference between the no migration and the with migration scenario is uh, in age groups zero to 50, because that's the, the years of the projection period. Uh, and we say what difference, see what difference it makes, but there's no story behind uh, beyond saying what if. Now the way forward, in my view, usually migration projections um, are based on net migrants, but for the kind of analysis that we are doing here, it would be very important to get away from net migration. <clears throat> it's easy to model, but hard to predict, and even less easy to understand because a net migrant is a person that not, does not exist, has no age, no gender, uh, no human capital. Technically speaking, I think the way forward, uh, we would need scenarios and assumptions both on gross immigration and on emigration. Now, I'm going to talk about five scenarios, four of which have been developed um, um, and mandated by the so-called ESPAS process, which is the European Strategy and Policy uh, Analysis System, which is a joint exercise between the Commission, the Parliament, and the European Council. And so let me just start with scenario number one. Scenario number one, that we will go back to a situation that we had in the early 2000s. You just remember the slide, the second slide that I have shown with the flows. This would mean external borders are more or less under control. Mixed flows continue, but there will be no dominance of asylum flows. Family reunion, marriage migration, and humanitarian admission in total would be more important than labor migration, but labor migration would still play an important role 
um, um, as an aging native workforce require the recruitment of labor and skills from third country. No additional barriers to labor mobility within the EU uh, would exist, so we would have a continuation of the situation that we had um, since the year 2000. Existing integration deficits would be likely to persist uh, because uh, labor migrants would not necessarily be selected, but definitely the others coming to the EU, there would be no uh, labor market test or no test whether their skills would match uh, the requirements of uh, domestic EU uh, member states labor markets. Now, I have introduced a scenario number two that was not developed uh, during the ESPAS process in the past, uh, which relates to the a protracted corona crisis. The first two uh, assumptions uh, about the future would remain the same, that borders are more or less under control or even more closed than in the past, and the mixed flows would continue. But we would see that family reunion, marriage, migration, and humanitarian admission would stay dominant, but might be reduced because of uh, increased uh, border controls and other reasons that I'm happy to discuss here. Labor migration would be drastically reduced due to high unemployment um, in EU countries, just as it has happened uh, with this drastic reduction that we have seen between the years 2008 and 2012, when it went down from 600,000 first permits um, for uh, employment and economic activities uh, in the early 2000s to just 200,000 a year between 2012 and 2015. Um, there would be travel warnings and selective border closures, creating barriers to mobility within the EU, just we are having it currently, for example, Hungary not allowing its citizens to leave or when they leave not to allow to come back without going into quarantine, which makes uh, border commuting for work uh, almost impossible. Um, and the integration deficits would grow as people with migrant background uh, are more likely to be unemployed and to be harder hit uh, by a protracted corona crisis. And we would see cases of emigration of people going back home, um, including third country nationals. A scenario number three would assume instability in the neighborhood in cases we have seen with the Syrian refugee crisis, which would come from a violent conflict or in the future from extreme weather conditions, producing large flows of people seeking protection in the EU. Um, this would add to existing integration challenges. It might lead to a situation where there's negative sentiment toward migrants uh, leading to greater electoral scores for political parties advocating restrictive asylum and migration policies, and large numbers of migrants could spend years in limbo um, in, a, in a situation where it's not decided whether they're allowed to stay or where it would be um, decided they have no right to stay, but there might be no possibility for return and readmission. Is scenario number four, if EU member states would become more selective in their admission of migrants, which would be a shift from present admission criteria with strong humanitarian elements to a stricter skills-based selection of labor migrants as we know them um, in the Australian and the Canadian um, immigration and selection system based on points, or a shift to a more demand and deployer-driven selection as uh, it's uh, existing in New Zealand and has al already been tried in the past by Sweden. Um, this would also probably require more restrictive handling of humanitarian admission as countries like Australia, Canada, and New Zealand are selecting refugees that they are resettling um, uh, onto their territory in contrast to the EU countries where you basically have spontaneous arrivals of asylum seekers. Um, the economic gains from migration um, in, under these conditions would be larger, um, whereas uh, integration challenges would be smaller, and it would, it, would be made, it would be easier to make a positive case 
um, about migration vis-a-vis -vis domestic uh, electorates. A fifth scenario that I've called going native, public opinion growing more skeptical or even hostile to the admission of foreigners, a general political consensus effectively leading to much lower immigration, higher return rates, uh, as well as higher return rates of already established migrants, um, and a general climate uh, that would, under these conditions, most likely also reduce intra-EU mobility and incentivize emigration at a larger scale. Um, and the main challenge here would be managing demographic aging, gradual population decline, and the shortage of skills without um, recurring on imported migrant labor. We know at least one developed economy that has decided to embark on this path, and this is Japan. Um, so uh, the five scenarios are not mutually exclusive. EU member states can and will have different migration policies and trajectories, as they are autonomous when it comes to the admission of third country nationals, both in cases of asylum and in cases of labor migrants. Um, we will see probably diversity, and so some countries can follow one uh, scenario, others more another. And scenarios could materialize consecutively. So scenario number two, which is a kind of a near casting scenario, assuming what will be the likely effects of the COVID crisis um, this year, next year, maybe in the following two or three years. Uh, this could end uh, already in a couple of years and be replaced by another scenario. So, um, dear friends and colleagues, this was it. Happy to discuss uh, just this presentation and all other questions that might arise. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rainer, for this um, great intervention. Um, uh, I have one question for you, just as, as, as a quick discussion point for you before we move on to the next speaker. Um, oh, actually, two questions, <laughs> if you can, you can answer them briefly. So one is, the scenarios that you presented are, are very interesting. Um, what are they based out of? Sort of, were they based on discussions with, with decision makers, policy makers, stakeholders, or sort of, what, what, how were they developed, basically? And the second question was um, on family family migration, basically. And I was wondering, isn't this particular channel of migration easier to forecast, to predict to the future? Because for people to be reunited, you need somebody in Europe to, to, to apply for family unification. And in countries likely have information on that. So, so I wanted to get your opinion or your expertise on, on whether um, family migration is being forecasted quite successfully uh, and whether countries are doing that and whether it is easier than, than other forms of migration. First question, I have already said the scenario number two has been inserted by me just recently because when we were doing this, uh, developing these scenarios um, in the, uh, over the last five years, for the ESPAS report uh, 2019, uh, the COVID crisis was not uh, at the horizon, as we all know. Um, the other scenarios uh, have been developed um, um, in, the, in the context of, of what is called the ESPAS. This is a foresight exercise that is a, a systematic foresight exercise that is done inside uh, the Commission and the Parliament um, with some help of the European Council. There is. Uh, dedicated units that are working on that. And so that's based on, on expert discussions inside the commission with, with some feedback from external experts. So we, I have developed these scenarios and then they have been refined in, in expert discussions with, with, with colleagues. Okay? So family reunion. I think it's very important to understand there's two completely different types of family reunion. The one is a classical family reunion that emerged from the guest worker model. You had one key person being allowed to, to work in Europe or recruited, usually recruited, and then some of these persons established themselves in Europe, and then they were allowed to bring their dependent family members, spouses and uh, dependent children below the age of 18 with them as soon as they had established themselves. As we have not been recruiting many labor migrants 
in the recent past, this model today mainly applies to recognized refugees. So if, you're re if you come as a refugee by yourself and you have still family members living in camps in Lebanon or in Jordan or um, back in Turkey, then under certain conditions you are allowed to re reunite with them in the country that gave you asylum. It's more difficult for people who only get subsidiary protection where uh, in most countries that's more cumbersome. But the most important form of family reunion today is marriage migration. This marriage migration takes place between diaspora members with EU, mostly with EU citizenship living in Europe, second and third generation or longer, and distant relatives or distant uh, acquaintances in the, the region of origin of the grandparents or great-grandparents. So we have diaspora migration between certain parts of Turkey and Germany, between certain parts of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, to France, to Spain, uh, to, to Belgium. And this is not so easy to predict because the question whether this uh, marriage takes place or not is one question, and the other is where would the couple reunite? And whether a diaspora member marries in the country where he or she lives, among peers or even into the mainstream uh, of the dominant society, or whether you get married to someone who um, uh, is living in the ancestral land of your grandparents is a decision that is not easy to predict. Thank you very much, Raina. Um, if you do have additional questions for Raina, please just post them in the chat box. We will be able to follow up on some of them later in the discussion, or we'll also transfer uh, questions um, to Raina later. Um, so thank you very much, Raina. We now move on to our second sp speaker, Holger from, uh, from Frontex. Holger, over to you. Uh, you're muted still, I think. There we go. <laughs> the floor is yours. Yes, and hello uh, from, from Warsaw. Uh, sorry, I did not unmute myself there. Um, well, I want to express, first of all, my, my thanks to the organizers for having me. It's a, a real pleasure um, to be with you, even in this virtual format. Uh, for sure, I would have loved to trade uh, Vienna, uh, Warsaw for Vienna uh, today. Uh, as it is, um, I want to talk to you about um, uh, latest trends uh, in irregular migration uh, in Europe, and uh, I will now try and share my slides with you. Which I believe is hopefully a success. Yes, we can see them well. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, my presentation is is uh, less conceptual uh, and maybe less technical, and it's more or less um, about what went on this year in, in irregular migration. Uh, the year, I believe, uh, we could have all done without, uh, probably. What I want to do is uh, I want to take us back to um, the very beginning of the year. Um, and recall that the, the year started off with strong uh, migratory pressure in comparison to the, to the same months of last year. And this was on almost all the major migratory routes uh, to Europe. So January and February uh, saw almost 50% more detections of illegal border crossings uh, reported compared to the same two months of uh, 2019. Uh, illegal border crossings, I know it's quite uh, an expert audience, but maybe for those who are not so familiar, it's our key indicator um, uh, for uh, roughly translating into irregular arrivals um, at the land and sea uh, external borders. Uh, around and about uh, this time uh, here, beginning of the year, I was working on the risk analysis for uh, 2020. Uh, the annual risk analysis and I suggested for um, a variety of reasons 
such as, for instance, various uh, destabilizing trends in key countries of origin, factors like the persistent uh, risk of mass outflows from the uh, Idlib region of Syria, as well as, for instance, the slowing rate of decrease of migrant arrivals in, in recent years, I suggest that 2020 could well see the turnaround in the number of arrivals of irregular migrants um, after, of course, uh, the peak of 2015-2016. Uh, we've seen uh, falling numbers and um, little. Uh, well, it the storm was already brewing. We started to, to see on, on CNN how uh, the Wuhan region was closed down, but. Um, things turned out quite differently, as we can see here on the slide, um, due to what I think most of us did not have on the on the immediate horizon uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, for us, uh, the pandemic started more or less in March, if you recall, in Europe. Uh, and the containment measures introduced by, by our member states, but also third countries, and most importantly, uh, key transit countries, they led to a decrease in arrivals of, uh, as you can see, a, a very dramatic decrease of over three-fourths in, um, in April compared to March. Uh, into April until mid-May, all routes uh, reported a sharp decrease in arrivals, except um, the Western African route. Um, so that's um, to the Canary Islands. Uh, I'll come to that in, in, a, in a minute because it's a quite interesting effect in fact, of uh, the containment measures. Uh, then the trend after partial uh, and, and gradual lifting uh, of measures was uh, uh, at the end of May, uh, we saw a slowly resuming flow reported to, uh, to all borders. Now here, um, the map, uh, so some of you may well uh, have seen uh, different versions of this map. Uh, it's, a, it's a standard staple in a risk analysis sort of presentation uh, by the agency. It shows the main migratory routes uh, at the EU external borders. Um, uh, green, of course, are the land routes, blue the sea routes. And here we have an overview of detections of, um, of illegal border crossings uh, beginning of the year to the 15th uh, of September. Uh, per route in comparison with the same period of 2019. Um, if you uh, would uh, sum them up, uh, so far this year we have seen approximately 63,450 uh, detections. And uh, if you did the comparison to the same period of last year, uh, that is in fact a decrease of around 16%. Uh, we do see here, and that's uh, the point of the slide really, we do see here an uneven development across the different routes. Um, and that's partially, of course, due to uneven restrictive measures across countries along these routes. Um, and what I really want to do here, I want to focus on the overarching effects of, of uh, the pandemic on irregular migration. And all of these effects, and, and, and you know, that's how it uh, fits into um, the day of presentations, all effects we probably would not have seen foreseen, uh, we probably would not have foreseen in the beginning um, of the year. The one route that did not see the uh, described dip um, during the spring was, as already mentioned, uh, the Western African route. Um, uh, that's migration to the Canary Islands by boat, uh, a long ongoing uh, phenomena at uh, what counts towards our external borders. Um, and that's because containment measures by the Moroccan authorities have meant that migrants from, from mostly West Africa were unable to cross through Morocco or uh, fly into Morocco uh, to leave then uh, in the north uh, by boat uh, via the or in sea or the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, what we call uh, the Western Mediterranean route. So some of the migratory flow uh, has been, in fact, rerouted from the Western Mediterranean to the Western African route, and that's why we have such a, seen such a strong increase here in arrivals to the Canary Islands. Um, 
also a very widely seen factor at the external borders was a change in the modi operandi of people smugglers. Uh, and of course, uh, the audience is well aware that uh, a, a grand share of, uh, of migration here happens, uh, what we call facilitated or with the help and employment of people smugglers. Um, and these modi operandi changed um, to avoid detection uh, and with that, crucially, uh, a mandatory uh, quarantine uh, that was imposed uh, almost uh, throughout the external borders. Um, so, for instance, in the Eastern Mediterranean, we've seen uh, an increased use of speedboats um, uh, that can uh, uh, avoid uh, interception. Um, speedboats uh, oftentimes used um, in other instances, for instance, for uh, for drug smuggling, um, the targeting of non-hotspot islands was a, a large phenomenon in the Eastern Mediterranean. Again, trying to to avoid uh, detection, uh, we also see, saw an increased use of leisure boats, uh, like sailing yachts, um, which do in the summer uh, traffic. Uh, they melt in sort of the summer traffic in the in the Mediterranean. In the Western Balkans, uh, in this regard, we saw an increase in the use of tunnels, uh, the use of false documents, of course, always a persistent phenomena. Um, migrants hidden in vehicles, uh, clandestine entry attempts uh, increasing as well. Another um, uh, uh, phenomenon really is um, a, a visible um, increase of economic migration from North Africa. Tunisia and Algeria were propelled uh, to second and first most common nationality of migrants so far this year. Um, this is, uh, of course, an effect primarily of, of a complete tanking of the tourism industry in, in Egypt um, uh, during the summer. Uh, it became a bit better um, towards the fall um, in terms of uh, condition there for a um, for main uh, um, um, source of income in Algeria and uh, Tunisia. Uh, there was also an interesting further effect uh, of poll factors. Um, there were some stops in readmissions of certain nationalities by some member states. Uh, and in general, of course, returns of migrants uh, without a right to protection uh, almost stopped during the, the first months of the, uh, of the COVID crisis. Um, because of these last two factors, um, the Central Mediterranean saw this higher pressure uh, as seen here on, on the slide than uh, during the summer of, of 2019. Now, um, in, um, in the spirit sort of, of, I really like this earlier remark of attempting to be vaguely right, uh, I want to uh, say some, something about the, the short-term future. Um, in the coming months, um, we do believe migratory movements will be highly dependent, of course, on the evolution of COVID-19 containment measures in countries of origin, uh, transit, and in member states themselves. Uh, rising infection rates right now, uh, here's a relatively current uh, ECDC map. Um, they may well signify a return uh, to firmer restrictions of movement uh, and thus bring down numbers once more. Uh, the effect will be different in different regions. For instance, in the Western Balkans, the share of transiting migrants staying in um, migrant camps is, is higher than in other regions. And uh, what we saw already early this year is that if these camps uh, then are under, under um, restrictions, are under lockdown, the effect on attempts to cross the uh, borders, uh, the northern borders of the Western Balkans into the EU, were much more affected than, um, than elsewhere. Um, on the other hand, as we're approaching winter, a decrease in uh, of course, uh, migratory movements due to uh, what we call seasonality and weather conditions, they can also be expected, um, as always. Um, but it must be noted um, that any change in the uh, migration policies of key transit countries could quickly override, of course, the seasonal pattern of arrivals. We remember um, the uh, events of late February uh, as just uh, a tale of caution here. Um, the attention to uh, uh, containment measures um, 
may well further exacerbate uh, the determination of migrants to leave um, before the new restrictions uh, are enacted. Uh, smuggling networks, as always, will uh, stand by and look to profit from this uh, and use different solutions to avoid border controls. Um, as we do assess that migrants stuck in transit in third countries have not yet abandoned their original travel uh, and destination plans. Considering the number so far uh, the summer, um, it would uh, appear that the presumed backlog of would-be migrants stuck still in transit has not yet been fully drawn down. Um, I think I'm sort of close to or maybe already exceeded my 10 minutes. Um, so uh, given that we have a lot of experts here um, speaking about um, scenario building the long run, um, I will uh, probably uh, stop here. Uh, they uh, will present much more informed prognosis uh, about the longer term future than, uh, than I uh, could. And uh, with that, um, I will yield the floor back to Jasper. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you, Olga. Um, much appreciated also for sticking to the time there, and thanks for the interesting uh, presentation. Uh, quick follow-up from my side. Um, Frontex is also in the, in the business of forecasting, let's say. Um, many, uh, much of the data that you presented um, are sort of current now casts, if you will, from this year, and, and trends that will likely lead to um, future, and that give us a lot of ideas about what is to be expected. Um, Frontex is also doing different ways of actually looking to the future using data and using experts. Could you quickly elaborate on, on sort of the general approach that Frontex takes there and how EU member states are using those, um, the products that come out of these um, forecasting attempts? Uh, sure, um, and, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, switch from, let's say, the now casting to to also uh, tell you a little bit about the work of the agency in, um, uh, in forecasting and foresight. We do, in fact, both. Um, we have uh, been doing a, a, was a, a trial, uh, in effect, of uh, forecasting. Uh, it was a three-month um, horizon uh, per uh, migratory route. Of course, we're an operational agency, and for that, we look um, to uh, the allocation of border guard resources, uh, primarily in line with, with our operational mandate. Um, and currently, we're in the evaluation phase of that um, to see how well we did, uh, if we really used um, the, um, the resources wisely, uh, if we did enough to uh, bring in uh, experts from member states, and so on. Um, uh, then uh, foresight um, is um, something we do in, in, in fact, it's mandated now by our new uh, mandate. Uh, you may uh, know that the agency received a new mandate at uh, end of last year. We like to call it uh, the 2.0 uh, regulation of the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. Um, it is uh, an exercise um, uh, of um, foresight uh, for a 10-year uh, period, and it is the uh, beginning of a multi-annual strategic policy cycle for um, integrated border management. Um, based on this um, analysis, uh, in terms of methodology, it's you know very much what um, others have presented, starts with a, a literature review, uh, uh, goes into megatrends and thematic risk assessment scenario building. Uh, at the result. Um, this product then uh, goes to the Commission to develop uh, policy priorities and strategic guidelines um, for a uh, what is a, a five-year strategic policy cycle on, on integrated border management. And um, so we're, we're now sort of at the stage where we have um, produced this product and uh, it's now in the uh, Commission's um, uh, um, court um, to to uh, to start uh, on the basis of of our foresight uh, strategic policy cycle. 
Thank you very much, Holger. Very, um, very interesting insights there, uh, and more to come from, from Frontex in those aspects. Um, if you do have additional questions for Holger, please drop them in the chat uh, section of this webinar or email us directly. We'll be happy to get in touch with Holger again for any follow-up questions. I'm now handing over to our third um, speaker, um, Tobias Heidland, uh, Heidland is talking about COVID-19 and future migration flows. Tobias, over to you. We can see the slides. We can't hear you yet. Okay, I think someone turned my mic on. Sorry, the control panel <laughs> has gone. So when I went uh, full screen, right? Um, so thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, for the nice conference. In my time input, I'll start um, disentangling the most important impacts of, of COVID-19 on migration flows as I see them from, from a micro level. And in this exercise, my thinking is guided by a couple of the models that we've seen, quantitative economic and, and other disciplines, migration forecasting models, and also a lot of work with individual level survey data. But I'll do without any formula, any numbers, because I don't think that the quantitative models can at the moment give us a clear prediction about um, what's happening. What I think the, the models, the more rigorous quantitative models can do well is guide our thinking. So uh, when thinking about migration flows, I think it's crucial not to uh, consider these flows as, as a force of nature. Um, I very much uh, would like to second Rainer Münz's point that we shouldn't be thinking about net flows, rather about gross inflows, gross outflows, because that's the decisions that people take. Um, migration is made up or migration flows are made up by individuals who take decisions based on the circumstances they live in, the, the information they have, the policy framework that, re that restricts the, the choices. And it's in this context where we can think about uh, the impact of, of, uh, of COVID-19. Now, I'll be thinking about um, the next years, not so much about the very, very short term that we just saw in the Frontex numbers, March to June effect, or the, the um, slow in mobility, slowdown in mobility that uh, Liz Collette mentioned in the morning. So uh, to start off, let's talk about um, what I think is the most likely economic scenario. In my view, we'll see a situation where after the crisis, uh, the different policy responses uh, towards the disease will have led to a highly heterogeneous economic damage across different countries, and probably all countries will suffer somewhat, but currently the, the economic damage uh, differs um, quite substantially. In the second quarter, um, the annualized drop in GDP in, in the UK was about 20%, was about 2% in Japan, and a few countries um, are doing rather well. Rwanda, for example, still expecting positive growth this year. Um, and these economic aggregates hide the fact that within each country, the, the impact of, uh, um, of these losses differs a lot by profession, by economic sector, and so on. Um, so as, as you're probably all aware, um, there are some industries and large part of the public sector um, where we haven't felt any negative effect, not we have worked longer hours than before, but there are others, um, especially the self-employed, especially informal workers, in, in sectors such as uh, hospitality who have been um, hit very hard. And um, we should look at um, the likely effects within country as well when thinking about what's gonna happen to um, migration flows from certain countries. So is the typical migrant from a country um, the one who's been um, harder hit or less, uh, less hard hit? Or did the burden um, of, the, of the shock just fall on those who, uh, who typically would have uh, stayed put anyway? And we shouldn't see a response in the, in the flows. So uh, some of this economic fallout will, will last for years. And while in many areas we'll hopefully bounce back uh, very quickly in, in uh, economic terms, um, uh, probably where vaccines are available earlier, that will go um, faster. In other places, uh, will take longer. My fear is that especially the poorer, the not so well governed countries in the world will lose out, and that the, the health toll, the larger economic damage, and also um, specifically targeted bilateral immigration bans um, on these countries uh, will persist for longer. 
So to guide our thinking, I find it helpful to consider four stylized kinds of households uh, which take migration decisions and what happens to their willingness uh, to migrate or their migration intentions and also their ability to, uh, to migrate. And what also matters for, um, for the migration decision is, of course, uh, the demand for labor. Um, but as, as Rainer Münz has just shown us in, in the initial graph, is that uh, labor, labor migration is just one flow among many. So let's consider households that are more or less affected by the, by the economic shock and um, who live in richer and poorer countries, respectively. So first, uh, let's start with high-income countries. Here, for people who are personally unaffected by the economic toll, hardly anything changes beyond the very short term. Um, so people might be a bit unwilling to risk moving to another country in the, um, in, the, um, in the health crisis. But apart from that, we shouldn't expect too much of a difference in terms of migration outcomes in the medium or long term. By contrast, the household is economically uh, severely hit. Um, then out of economic necessity, um, they uh, will have more reason to, to send a labor migrant in the future. And importantly, um, if we're thinking about, say, EU countries, um, then the preferred destination countries for these households are typically still in reach because there are few policy barriers in place to restrict their, their movement. So while the preferred destination country may change, um, uh, people might not go to the UK um, and rather prefer Germany right now, um, there is unlikely to be a really large reduction in, in migration flows uh, from certain countries in the very short term, uh, or in the short and medium run, apart from these effects like unemployment and lower demand uh, for, for labor in the destination country. However, um, what we can expect is probably that these um, diverted flows, so people going to other countries than before the crisis, may also create some persistence through uh, network effects and um, they may, that may make um, migration uh, off the beaten path um, easier for others who follow these corridors in the future. So the countries that, go, that, that get through the crisis well, um, I expect to, to benefit in attracting uh, more labor migrants um, than, bef uh, than, than uh, before the crisis um, as the economy goes back to normal. Okay, so uh, let's move to, to poorer countries of origin. If someone lives uh, in such a country, is personally unaffected, we should expect the, the crisis in destination countries to reduce their incentive to migrate if they are uh, well off at home, um, and migration becomes less attractive because the destination countries um, have lower demand for labor, then that could decrease flows. And again, there might be this diversion of flows to other destinations which, which uh, um, got through the crisis in a uh, better. And a group which might be severely affected is households who are personally strongly affected by COVID-19. Um, for them, there's more reason to migrate, but credit constraints may come, become binding, um, so migration become, may become impossible for them uh, uh, due to the economic shock. And oops, sorry, uh, what we uh, could there see is a greater um, inequality in migration outcomes depending on how different countries and the people uh, got through the crisis. And there will be um, probably greater inequality between countries in terms of the economic outcomes and in combination with uh, very specifically targeted bilateral uh, short-term immigration policies aimed at reducing the, the risk of, uh, of contagion uh, with, uh, with COVID-19. This is, um, I think, likely to, to, agree to uh, lead to a greater inequality in migration outcomes as well. And as we've seen, the um, incentives can change both within country and also between countries, um, and the ability to migrate can develop uh, differently for, for different countries. So I see a particular risk for uh, losing out on the gains of international migration for emerging and developing countries that are um, heavily affected uh, by, by the uh, corona shock. And um, the most important factor in the medium run um, will then not be the individual incentives to migrate, but policy changes in destination countries, I think. So, um, yeah, to, to, uh, to give you a bit more detail on this point, um, from quantitative uh, models, what you usually get out is that immigration policy is the most important um, lever um, when it comes to determining the size of flows, given uh, some uh, people, uh, well, the size of the people uh, the amount of people who want to uh, to migrate to, to a certain destination country. And migration is 
uh, migration policy is not a push factor it, as it's, it's often presented um, in the media or discussed by politicians. It's rather a very restrictive filter which decreases the number of people who, uh, who get through, indicated here by, um, uh, by these triangles. So um, only a few percent of those who would like to move permanently to a country actually do so in a given year. And the most, reason, most important reason for that is restrictive migration policy. So for any forecasting exercise, it's crucial to understand what the future immigration policy would like and uh, would look like. And um, without this information, all quantitative estimates of future flows um, are highly uncertain. And what will happen to migration policy? Well, what's Realistic is um, that some of the trends from the literature will persist. And what we know from research on public attitudes is that in economic crisis, preferences for immigration turn more restrictive. And it's not only that um, those people who are personally affected who, um, yeah, who, who uh, have more restrictive preferences in a crisis, it's very important to realize that social, uh, so, so-called uh, socioeconomic, that uh, social tropic concerns, sorry, um, matter. That's preferences that are shaped by um, the expected effects of an immigrant inflow on others in a person's in-group. So, for example, I might be worrying about uh, the, the competition effect of immigration on some co-nationals that I don't know personally even, although I, I myself uh, might even benefit from this immigration economically. So these sociotropic concerns um, tend to be more important than concerns about individuals' own personal economic situation. And the individual vote is, of course, not the only important factor in determining policy. A lot depends on the political discourse, the media environment, the political economy in respective countries. So my personal expectation is that there would be more polarization in public attitudes towards uh, migration over the next years, both, again, within countries and in regions such as the EU. And that might lead to changes in immigration policy that then again affect future flows. So key points in a nutshell once again, uh, first from considering the effects of COVID-19 on migration flows, we should consider both the between and the within country changes due to the crisis. Secondly, um, in most areas of migration, we should not expect less willingness to migrate because economic pressures will, if anything, increase incentives to migrate for parts of the population. And finally, the most important determinant for the size of the flows is and will be in the future the migration policy of rich destination countries. And this is also the greatest source of uncertainty when we try to uh, predict migration flows. Thanks. And over to you again, Jesper. Thank you very much, Tobias, for this very interesting presentation. Um, again, I take the, the, take the privilege to, to launch one a question of my own first <laughs> um, and then later we'll discuss uh, with the whole group but um, I saw sort of two points that you made quite strongly presentation on the one hand it's important to look at the micro level so individual people making decisions that are driven by certain characteristics um, now in most forecasting efforts that countries undertake um, they usually do not deal with micro level data information about individuals often they deal with flows, right? So many people arrived at the border or so many people applied, enrolled in a service or applied for asylum, uh, applied for a work permit and so forth. So we, we talk about um, most data that is used for forecasting actually at the macro level, so aggregated data. Now, uh, I know you've been involved in different forecasting exercises. Can you give us a sense of how including the micro level perspective and in including additional information rather than just past flows in migration models can actually improve them. And do you think this is a way we should uh, um, invest further in the future? Um, yes, excellent question. Thank you. So um, there are different ways of, of creating micro founded uh, migration models. And at least for the, for the short and medium run, um, a way of uh, yeah, way forward um, that I like quite a lot is um, gravity style uh, panel models. So uh, gravity uh, models were, were mentioned in the very beginning um, as um, a potential way forward. So these are models which include structural explanatory factors such as the distance between countries, the um, shared languages, these kinds of factors. And these stay um, relatively 
um, relatively fixed in the short term, but they interact a lot with other drivers. So models which uh, come from this micro perspective think about uh, the individual incentives for migration, for example, um, I as a potential migrant have just lost my job um, in the country of origin, and now I'm considering uh, the situation whether to stay, whether to migrate internally, whether to migrate internationally, where to go. Um, I think that's the way forward um, of modeling these, these um, uh, in these short-term forecasts. Um, and yeah, I think the way forward here is to combine um, surveys such as the Gallup World Poll, where you have um, information about uh, the, um, yeah, the, the willingness to live in another country um, or um, also uh, plans, uh, concrete plans about migration with um, the flow perspective and what we know from, uh, for example, uh, Jakob Bijak's um, uh, presentation about uh, the issues in forecasting there. And what we should arrive at eventually in the next couple of years, I think, is a model where, or is, is kind of model classes where we um, separately think about uh, the incentives for individual migrants and then how these interact with the um, uh, with the policy component. Um, and uh, what is still missing, um, in, to my knowledge, from uh, from modeling is um, really dealing with the destination country choice. Um, so how are flows diverted? I think this is really the um, um, the thing to um, yeah to to address in um, in our modeling. And here I think it's crucial to have the micro perspective in to think about individual language skills, for example, who can be diverted realistically from one country to another, and who will be unresponsive to. Uh, yeah, unemployment in a in a French-speaking country um, because they they really want to go for a French-speaking country, for example. Right. Th thank you, Tobias. So a strong argument to, to to go beyond just looking at who came in the past and and extrapolating that trend into the future, but actually taking into account various sources of data, survey data, and others, uh, also on the micro level, so on the individual level, decision making level. Let's say. Um, to arrive at better predictions for the future. Uh, I wanted to ask one other follow-up question, and, and, and yeah, and I'd like to answer fairly briefly. Um, you also, the second strong point you made in your presentation was the, on the significance of policies and their impact. Now, there is a little bit of a, a controversial discussion around you know, what do policies actually do? Uh, can border control policies, restrictive policies actually affect flows or will flows just be diverted into other channels that might go, um, that might not appear in official statistics, right? Um, uh, so, so some policymaker might be worried about the, the power of their own uh, policies they're putting in place. Now you're suggesting that there is evidence saying that the policies are the strongest factor when it comes to flows and that looking to the future, future policies are likely to shape most significantly, the, the flows that EU policymakers can expect here. Can you can you briefly comment on that, on, on the power of policies and the confidence policymakers can have uh, uh, in the legislation that they put in place? Um, well, yeah. So I think what is um, what is important for for policymakers is uh, coordination with other countries, especially at the EU level. Um, because there's the risk of diversion, I, I absolutely see that. Um, and it's a bit difficult to, to pin this down in quantitative models so far. So uh, a shout out to uh, um, to uh, not only the people at GM, GMDAC, um, but also uh, maybe statistical offices, policymakers who might be listening. What would be fantastic for, for us researchers for these kinds of modeling exercises would be monthly um, data, which is standardized across uh, different European countries. So um, with this kind of data, it would be much easier to uh, to hand code, for example, policy changes in, in a future um, research project at the monthly level as well. And then we could see um, these um, divergence of flows not only in, um, in yearly data where it's really difficult to uh, claim causality, but at a finer granularity. And um, I think if, if uh, Eurostat or uh, any other institution could provide that in the future, that would be um, great service to all migration forecasters and migration research. Thank you very much, Tobias. I hope uh, many policymakers at home in their offices were listening and, um, and 
surely they also um, can get behind that goal of arriving at more fine-grained granular data, which is, of course, hard to come by. Uh, thank you very much, Tobias, for this intervention. We'll now um, uh, transition to our last speaker in this panel. Um, uh, Petra Bendel from the SVR in Germany, and Petra will provide a sort of um, complementary perspective uh, on the use and relevance of these different um, approaches and the potential harms they can do. So I'm excited for Petra's intervention. Petra, over to you if you're ready. Um, we can we can't see your slides yet. We can see a black screen. Very sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. I'm sorry, but you can't see me. I don't know what happened. I actually, um, well, I just begin talking maybe, and maybe you can see me afterwards. Mm -hmm. Again, anybody think, can help me because they somehow jumped out right. of the... No problem at all. Um, Lucas, who is um, helping us with technical issues in the webinar, Lucas, do you have Petra slides on, on your computer as well and would be able to share them? And then, Petra, you could tell Lucas to forward each slide when you're ready. Um, I don't know, if uh, Lucas, if we, could, if we could do that. He is in the process of sharing yeah. the slides. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas. And I think, can you see me now? Now yes. we can see. Perfect, Ben. So, uh, dear colleagues and um, dear Jasper, thank you so much for having me here um, in this insightful conference uh, and also in this very insightful panel. Uh, what you see on the slide is actually my university affiliation. So I'm here, what we call in German, with two hats on. I'm uh, also a university professor at Erlangen uh, University. Um, and as such, I can anticipate to you maybe and invite you to follow up on a scenario building, which we are doing in my team at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg. Uh, it's a scenario building that we are doing um, for the next few months on migration and integration amidst the uh, COVID-19 pandemics with regard especially to German migration but also integration policy. So it is very close to what uh, Tobias and also Rainer have pre just presented, uh, but we dive somehow more into the details of immigration in just one country that was also uh, part of the ideas to be as pre presented to, to drive more into the each, uh, each EU member state. Um, but this is not what I've been asked to present right now. Uh, I couldn't either because we're still in the process of doing so. Um, but I can invite you to, to read uh, the publication that is due in January next week and supported by the Mercato Foundation in Germany. Um, what I've been asked uh, is to take one step back and to have a sort of critical look um, on the role of science or sciences that uh, science can and should play in foresight. Uh, and I will maybe start with uh, what I have called alarmism, following by the question what we really know, uh, how to deal with what we know and what we also don't know, and what we should aim at. So, um, Lucas, if you could present the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, alarmist warnings in projections have lately gained certain popularity in Europe. We're still talking about, the, uh, about Europe. And let me just give you the example raised by Stephen Smith two years ago. It's quoted now in the English version of last year, but the original stems from 2018. And there Smith, Smith warned that they, a quote, young Africa would relentlessly make its way towards the, quote, the old continent that is Europe, and that in just more than 30 years, a fourth or even a third part of the European population would be of African descent uh, if we were not able to fight poverty. Um, in absolute numbers, this, this would mean that 150 to 200 million people would be living in Europe then in, in, in 30 years who had come from the African continent. 
And this hypothesis stems from the idea that a big and increasing number of young uh, people in, in the countries of origin in Africa do not find economic perspectives and therefore will forcibly uh, may, may their, may make their ways towards the north. Alarming projections like this, however, are not new. Uh, if you remember, some of you might remember that by the end of the 1980s and beginning of the 1990s, warnings of a potential uh, new period of so-called, quote, great migration uh, have been issued already, even then, but particularly today. I think we have to be very, very careful with such alarmistic projections. Because set against the backdrop uh, from propagandists of a coming, quote, big population exchange, a right-wing populist or even extremist instrumentalization uh, of such projections um, is realistic. So we should be very careful and we carefully have to avoid uh, parting from assumptions that uh, the demographic explosion alone would be unavoidable of projecting that even if democracy develops as projected uh, by Smith, this development then would necessarily lead to more migration. Uh, we also have to, to avoid um, to part from a somehow homogeneous, in any case, underdeveloped Africa, whose population would migrate directly towards Europe in masses. Neither does the biggest part of migrants come from the poorest countries, since these lack the resources to even migrate, let alone in masses, nor do the people from countries with high birth rates automatically migrate towards those with lower birth rates, from poorest towards the richest countries, from the most populated countries towards the lesser populated regions, from, from the tropics towards the climatically more moderated zones, and, uh, and finally, from the younger towards the older areas. So this is something we have to bear in mind, not only with regard to projections, but also with regard to scenario buildings. Um, this, of course, does not mean that democr de demography wouldn't matter. But to remain within the example of the migration from Africa, we would then have to state that on a global scale, there's no such thing as an exodus from Africa. Uh, the biggest share of African migrants remain on the same continent, and it also has to be distinguished between different African regions. So if there is a, a intercontinental migration at all, Europe also is not the only destination among others, something that maybe sometimes sometimes get out of sight. And finally, there's no not only irregular migration on flight, but also migration into the educational and skilled labor systems. To speak with uh, François Héron, he's also, also quoted on the slide, um, this projection, the Smith projection, includes a lot of eco economic speculation. And to continue with Héron, the task, task of scientists consists neither in alerting authorities and the public, nor in appeasing or pleasing them. Uh, scientific uh, ethical responsibility rather consists in informing. It has then to represent the complexity and the very different starting positions of migration movements and motives, the different consequences for countries of origin and also for the receiving countries. So this complexity also has to be considered in pol political consulting in order to show how political and legal steering potentials uh, should react to it. Um, Lucas, if you could change the slide, please. Um, Given the very different theoretical models and preconditions we have also seen here, um, and given the different estimations and projections, researchers help themselves often with scenario buildings, and we have seen that in times of uncertainty, especially on this panel where we have talked about um, Europe and, and possible effects of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, when it comes to migration from Africa to still remain in the same research area, um, the joint Research Center of the European Commission used the topic of many more to come. Migration from and within Africa some two years ago and tried to draft three scenarios of migration instead of projections. And they part from four parameters identified as the main variables for migration. 
Of course, there's also demographics, but uh, it, it includes also the socioeconomic conditions, the ecolog ecological and climate-induced factors, and political stability. While stating that uh, a rise in migration is quite probable from Africa, GRC states that it is impossible to predict if this rise will affect mainly the inter-African inter mobility, and if so, if it will also affect other regions and continents. So in the end, actually, there's very little that we can say for sure, and uh, disappointingly enough, uh, this is, of course, particularly true for the unexpected events like COVID-19. Can you pass on the slide? And even more so, the study shows that even polls and surveys that have also been uh, several times mentioned here, and which for quite a while have aimed at predicting the motivation to migrate um, in young Africans, have proved to have only limited predictive credibility. These surveys are actually, um, as Ravenna uh, Soest underlined in her introduction, they are quite instructive when it comes to uh, determining a feeling of those wanting to migrate. However, in no way can they be taken as a realistic source for the migration processes to come. As an example, we, we might quote the, the Gallup poll on migration intentions during the period of 2010 to 2015. And during this period, around one third and one fourth of all Africans about 15 years said that they, that they want, uh, wanted to migrate. Remember the Smith's projection? Finally, what we saw was that only between four and 7% of those who said they were motivated to migrate actually did so, did make plans to do so even. And only 1% actually undertook any action to actually migrate to another country, leading to a 0.12% who really migrated. That is, the intention to migrate uttered in the interviews does not give us a real hint as to whether this migration actually will take place. So what do we really, really know about the motives that cause people to leave their country of origin? Decisions to migrate on the individual state, as Tobias had tried to, uh, to sum up, are not all just caused by demographic developments. Neither are they only the, the result of economic trends or only caused by climate-induced or political developments. It is, in fact, the entanglement of different motives that make individu individuals or groups decide to migrate or, uh, or rather to stay. And this complexity makes it so difficult to reach uh, a, a, um, uh, to, re to do research about migration causes and drivers or triggers, and certainly makes projections, forecasts, and early warning systems so controversial. So I think we should also be very clear about we, what we do not know to show where we lack data um, or where data is not regularly and systematically raised, and to be sure there's a whole lot of data missing from migration within and from many reasons. Um, but even if we, um, if, if our data are more often than not insufficient or inadequate, we might analyze what we know and which consequences this may have. But be clear then in highlighting a lack of knowledge and also uncertainty and disagreement among, um, among uh, researchers, as Susanne Melder has pointed out. At the same time, and as we have learned today, we have to deal with a lot of uncertainties uh, re re regarding the complexity of motives, implicit assumptions, and theoretical models, insufficient data, and future shocks, like the one we are experiencing right now. We also have to face different ways of interpreting the data we arrive at, and we certainly have to face very different methods and disciplines. Um, so this is also true for me for the uh, growing gap that I see between forecasts based on technical means, and we have heard some of them this morning, and those that are based on empirical social sciences. Rarely do these two meet each other and help to understand different coins of maybe the same metal, uh, but different uh, interpretations. And also, there's already a lot of early warning systems, forecasts, foresights, and projections going on in Europe. 
be it with the intention of providing better reception uh, conditions as uh, some of the models uh, we see in Switzerland, or be it with the intention of financing political measures with regard to integration as in Sweden, for instance. Then we do have early warnings from Frontex, we've seen one before, from EASO, from Brot für die Welt, from UNHCR, et cetera. That is to say, we do not lack research per se, but what do we need then? We certainly need better data and research relying on these data, of course. Um, we need more networks among these different pro projects and existing databases and definitely more international and interdisciplinary cooperation of which this meeting certainly is a good start. And this is why the German Export Council uh, that I'm, I'm chairing has supported the German, in, in the German presidency the EU's in, uh, initiative to build up a new network that coordinates and validates the existing research in Europe. Only then, I think, we, can we proceed to build up common and knowledge-based uh, policy recommendations. Uh, thank you then um, for listening and uh, keep updated with our scenario buildings and also with connecting different networks in existing in Europe. And I give the floor back to Jasper. I have a question back to you that I've also seen in the comments made in the, in the chat box. So you were referencing the Smith book, but there are also other um, economic studies and others that see or that estimate the growing demographic migratory pressures um, among African countries that could at some point spill over to the EU, even though currently it does so in a very limited, uh, limited way. And I, I see in your argument as well that, you know, it's very difficult. It's, it's, tricky or controversial to uh, uh, forecast these sort of patterns that, that are in the data because it could um, provide ground for populist movements, right-wing movements that are uh, spurring critical views on migrants, um, possibly increasing the risks of xenophobia, increasing the risk of anti-immigrant uh, violence and, and, and so forth. So the, the question behind that for me is, is in a way, do we um, use bad predictions that we know are not the best, or do we use no predictions, right? Is it better to have an estimate that we know is not accurate, or rather use no estimate at all? Because, of course, the policy world is placing a lot of demands for evidence-based policymaking. Right? The demand for forecasts, the demand for data is there. The data that is used is the official UN data in many of those projections. So, what do you what do you make of this? The risk of having uh, uh, possibly faulty predictions on the one hand, because there's so many unknowns, while at the other hand, scientists and, and, and researchers like yourself, of course, always urge policymakers to use the data that is out there and to to base their decisions on facts. Um, what do you what do you make of this sort of dilemma? Of course, it's a dilemma, but what, what I was just trying to say is that uh, it's a sort of call to be honest. It's a, um, a call to be honest about what we know, what we don't know about, um, and especially to be honest about complexity. Of course, we have to reduce somehow, we have to reduce complexity, but then uh, be honest about uh, if you use demographics as the only driver uh, in projections, this, this would be uh, to underestimate complexity of motives, complexity of drivers, complexity of the, um, the importance of policies as s 2 bs has just underlined, etc. So, um, so the, it's basically a call for a, an ethical understanding of projections, uh, even scenario buildings, and um, and also of of an ethical um, uh, approach when it comes to political consulting, especially. I was still muted. So uh, yeah, thanks thanks for this response. Um, uh, building on that question, how do you see also the role of of media, um, who is often sort of this interlocutor between policymakers and then researchers, right? And, and researchers, they release a study, and then what happens to those results, how they interpret it, is often um, 
uh, yeah, can go into different directions. And, and, and how do you see the role of media here and how can sort of researchers and policies, uh, policymakers uh, do a better job at not misunderstanding each other? Of course, it is very difficult to break down very complex, highly complex um, facts and figures to uh, to the media. But then uh, we do have very good media who try to be the brokers in in that, as, as specialists, um, uh, journalists who have specialized on migration. Uh, there are also in Germany. I don't know in other countries. Um, we do have something like a Mediendienst Integration, that's a service. Uh, survey from the journalists to other journalists um, breaking down um, uh, highly complex issues um, and findings from, from researchers. Um, so this could be a sort of a have a broker in between and also we ourselves as researchers, I think we can learn a lot still um, in breaking down our findings to to make them comprehensible to the uh, to the broader public, and uh, just to to mention one possible um, uh, issue uh, or one possible, um, I, w I was just told that my my internet is down. Is it? Am I still heard? Okay, perfect. Then I go. I just go on. <laughs> um, uh, we have a, uh, a network in uh, in Germany built up by okay. different institutions um, that aims at uh, networking bet between research institutes. Uh, it is called FFVT in German, um, and it also has the aim to um, to uh, make research more accessible to the broader public and also to the media. So there's also from the side of the researchers themselves, not from the, from only from the part of the media themselves, but also from the part of the researchers themselves, mm -hmm. uh, the idea to make ourselves more understood and more heard and internationally more connected. Yeah. I can, Thank I can you. post mm -hmm. you the link afterwards. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We would appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm looking at the chat box and potential questions coming in. Uh, uh, Lucas and colleagues, please alert me if there's anything else, uh, any other questions coming from from the floor. Uh, otherwise, I would, uh, in the remaining eight minutes, you open this topic to to other panelists uh, on this panel because it does, of course, affect all of us. Uh, Anna Munz, you work with decision makers, policy makers, uh, on a daily basis. Holger, you do too, and Tobias, you're in a lot of networks where. You're trying to bridge insights from academia and make them sort of intelligible for policymakers. And may, maybe, Reiner, if you're still with us, um, how do you respond to that, um, uh, that sort of critique to say there is a risk in putting out projections, there's a political risk in, uh, uh, yeah, in, in using, using these data? What, what would your response be? Yeah. The, the the attention span of uh, political decision makers is uh, um, usually small because they have so many things on their plate. So um, if it's not deemed to be really urgent or you are at risk of losing the next elections, um, it's not always easy to capture. But Petra has just, uh, I mean, referred to, to one of the products that I have produced during my time um, at the Commission, which is this report, Many More to Come, with a big question mark. And this uh, was to show that the, the idea that millions of Africans would show up the next day in Europe is, uh, uh, is ridiculous, but I have tried to underpin this with scientific arguments in the report, but usually you, you only get uh, the message through. So the report serves as a scientific backup to show that it's serious what you're saying, and you have good arguments, but the argument that you can push through is something that uh, uh, maybe um, finds place on half of a half of a page or something like that. Yeah, if you if you're directly talking. So, I think the the important translation, and I think Petra was just talking about this, is between scientific results, uh, an honest way of uh, using them in a transparent uh, manner. And then a few a few messages that you can distill. Occasionally there is a how you say 
one of the reasons why sometimes the dialogue between uh, the scientific side and the decision makers is not so easy is that uh, scientists need some kind of public. They are publishing things, but some some politicians would be more happy if uh, they would get the messages, not uh, not um, uh, I mean um, via a platform where it has already been published, but if uh, they would get them somehow in private. Uh, and could make use of them um, in, a, in a in a different way. So I think there's a certain tension between scientists or, I mean, funded research that uh, is made available generally, and uh, some preferences of policymakers who would like to get uh, uh, the the information more exclusively. Um, I'm happy to discuss this further, although we we don't have enough time for that. But. Mm. Right. Thank you very much, Ryan, for this direct response. Turning, turning to you, to be as, as a researcher, have you ever come across an estimate of yourself where you're sort of having second thoughts what this estimate could do, uh, what reactions it could cause by the media, by the t different parties or, or, or the public, and um, what is sort of your thought process uh, internally to think about whether to release something or not? Is it just purely what's in the data is the good, good to go, or are you thinking about so the, the political risks and forecasts and, and, and foresight. Um, well, yeah. So <clears throat> whenever you uh, you find something that is um, healthy, helpful for for um, especially extremists, um, both in parliament and um, say on social media, I think you need be need to be very careful. Um, so in the past, we've made the experience at our institute when it came to uh, sanctions towards Russia that that has been. Misused and and um, they kind of kind of turned uh, turned around in terms of the conclusions. Um, so uh, we're we're definitely highly aware of uh, of these issues. And I think in a in a field like uh, migration research, um, you need to be that shouldn't um, at all affect the um, the kind of conclusions that you make. But I think it should. Um, Create an additional layer of safeguarding and thinking about uh, the kind of interpretations um, and recommendations you make based on um, on the findings. So, um, whereas uh, probably in other disciplines, especially in economics, but but also other sciences, um, researchers can be a bit quick to uh, to throw out the results on, uh, say, Twitter. Um, I think. Uh, what we what we need to be aware of is that um, this this stuff can be taken out of context, um, uh, can be used for for alarmist messages. Um, so absolutely, with Petra Bendel um, in this respect, and um, that yeah, in, basically increases um, the the level of caution that we as researchers should have. Thanks, Tobias, and um, thank a big thanks to all of the speakers, and thank you very much for being uh, so disciplined with your time as well, um, and and making these very uh, fascinating interventions today. Thank you, thanks to everyone who participated out there in this uh, in this panel. I hope you found it interesting. If you do have any follow-up questions, you can still post them in the chat or contact us by letter. We have we we will be happy to recontact the speakers and, and try to get more responses for you. Um, we are now going into a one-hour break. Um, yeah, you can get your lunch and, and coffee and everything, and we would be very happy to um, rejoin here at 2 p.m. CET with the next um, session on the nexus between predictions and policy uh, making. And in this panel, we have representatives from EU member states like Germany. We have representatives from EU bodies like uh, EASO, um, and we have uh, leading researchers that present um, different research on forecast methods. So we'll be happy to see you again in, in one hour. Enjoy your lunch break, and thanks again to everybody involved. Um, see you soon. Thank you.